The only thing in life that really, really enables you to do all the other things you want to do is good health. And you may take it for granted when you're young, but the older you get, the more you realize how important it is, the choices you make about food and about exercise, about staying happy, about sleep. It's serious business. Keep yourself healthy for the sake of yourself and everybody you care about, your future families included. Okay? That's really serious business. I'm not kidding. The first question today is? Do you have any questions about chapter one in vowels and consonants? And you're already prepared. So you ask really quickly, right? Not just flip, flip, flip. Anybody have any questions? All right, this silence is what I wanted to avoid. Just hurry up and ask if you have questions. Don't flip through your book, yeah. Can you mention standard of breakfast Mandarin Chinese? Right. Does it mean Tongfa uh, or all the dialects in Chinese? Oh, in, in that case, they are talking exactly about Putonghua, Guoyu, exactly that. So if it talks about, if it used uh, Chinese in the next chapter, it means all the dialects. In general, yes. You have to watch the context because it gets tedious to say standard Mandarin Chinese over and over again. In that case, they may just say Chinese. But in general, you're right. If they say Chinese, it can be Hanyu, which can include all of the dialects. If it has the word Mandarin in it, it's always Putonghua or Guoyu. And standard Chinese is also always Putonghua or Guoyu. If it's just Chinese, you'll can Thank you. Anybody else? Yeah. Um, why does he say it is impossible for an Englishman to open his mouth without making some other Englishman despise Ah, can anybody answer that? This is a literature This is a Anybody know what the reference is to? All right. Here's an assignment. I'm going to write it down. Find out the source of that quote. It's very, very famous. How will you go about finding it? How will you look for it? How will you look for it? No, I'm saying I want you to find the source of this quote. How will you find the source of the quote? Pygmalion, there it is. Right. He's just quoting George Bernard Shaw. Okay, so that's the answer. I didn't remember because I haven't read through it again. I've read this book many, many times, so I didn't read it again for this class this time. I did page through it, though. Um, it's from Pygmalion, which was made or, later made into a movie called My Fair Lady. In fact, a lot of the dialogue in My Fair Lady comes straight from Pygmalion word for word. So if you've read the play and then you see the movie, it will be very familiar. A lot of it is word for word the same. And in the movie, there's a famous remark by Rex Harrison. Uh, he's the actor playing the character, Professor Higgins. And he says that an Englishman cannot open up his mouth without making another Englishman hate him. And that tells you a lot about English society of the time. And now it's less true, but it to some extent is still true. And it's true of all of us to some extent. And we've talked about a little bit about a regional variation of Mandarin in Taiwan. Hey, su bu su. Su bu su. When somebody talks like that, you have a reaction, right? Now, you won't hate that person, I don't think. My feeling is Taiwanese will not hate somebody like that, but you will, you, you will usually smile. It's kind of cute. And you know they are from where? Probably from the south. Probably not from Taipei. I suppose some people in Taipei could speak like that, but not too likely. Yeah, you know, the Taipei northern area. People tend to use Mandarin so much. Most people speak a more standard variety of it in Taiwan terms. But from the south, some people, especially older people, especially people outside big urban areas, they will have a strong Minan accent. 
and then you will have a reaction. You won't hate them. You will think, oh, you're from the South. That's so cute. How, how chinchia, how wenwai. That's my feeling when I hear it. I don't know about you. Do you have that feeling or not so much? When I hear it, I always feel happy because I think it reminds me of all the wonderful things about Taiwanese people that I love so much. When I hear that accent, especially in the South, so it makes me feel good when I hear it. It's cute. It's somebody who's going to be very kind and nice to you, is my feeling. But they're just saying that we react strongly to different varieties, different accents. And in England, the situation there is there is a very, very strong sense of class differences. So if you're in the educated class and you make more money, then you think you're superior. Well, this is true of humans everywhere, but in, English, in England it's really pronounced. You will feel superior to somebody who's from the east end of London, who is working class, who speaks something like Cockney. The feeling of class differences is very strong in England, even now. It was worse then, but it's still, still true now. So that's, that explains the remark. OK, anything else? And everybody remember it says? Says? Yeah? Mm -hmm. That those languages which are in danger is because of some social economy changes. Social economic changes, yes. I think I mean consider other things as um, important factors such as political situation or colonization. That's true. Politics has a big influence on it, but politics usually will work through the economy. And money talks. What really talks is money. And it's true that the government, especially you're feeling in Taiwan, it's true. Because the government imposed Mandarin on Taiwan starting in 1945, 1946. It was around that time. And at that time, because they wanted everybody to learn good Mandarin, they started suppressing it in places like schools and workplaces, especially in schools. And you heard your parents say that they were fined maybe 5 NT, 1 NT, or 5 NT for speaking Minayu, speaking Fang Yan in class. And it wasn't just Fang Yan, also Yuan Zhongmin, the Yuan Ye Shi. So in that case, politics did have a very strong influence. That's, that's absolutely true. But even if the government forces you to speak the standard language in class, you can go home and speak it all you want. During the Japanese era, they suppressed even that. Because they wanted people to speak Japanese back then. But they couldn't prevent you from speaking Minayu or Kajiahua or Yuan Zhumin Yuan at home. You can choose to keep it yourself. See, this is the point they're getting at. However, if you insist on using your native language as much as possible when it's not the standard language and you want to get a good job, what's going to happen? You have to learn the standard language. And in the process of learning the standard language, you will probably get rusty, rusty at your native language, depending on your age and depending on how much you still use your native language. If you live at home or if you have close contact with friends from home, you may still use it a lot and you keep it up very well. But how about your children? What are they going to do? What do you think? I think they tend to prefer to which has happened to all of you in this class, every single one of you, right? Every single one of you. Some of you may still be pretty good at Minayu, but I think all of you are probably more comfortable in Mandarin. Every one of you, is that right? For everything you want to say, if you want to have full freedom of expressing yourself, you're probably more comfortable in Mandarin. So that's what's happened. And it is political, but it's also economic because of work opportunities, especially in places like Africa. People will leave their villages, they'll go to the cities to get a job, and they'll be living around people from other parts of Africa or the country, and they all speak the standard language because they have to have a language in common. And slowly, they adopt that language and they find that their village language does not help them advance themselves economically. And for that reason, they often don't want their children to learn it because they're afraid their children will be held back by their native language. So absolutely, you're right. They probably should put more emphasis on politically, especially for places like, it's not just Taiwan. Like Spain, it's the same thing. They had everybody learn standard Castilian Spanish to the detriment of Catalan. And Catalan now is doing everything, the Catalan speakers are doing everything they can to revive their language and make it strong. 
just like is happening in Taiwan. It's not just Taiwan. This is happening in many countries of the world. In Germany, I have a song. I don't know if I can find it on YouTube during break. But there's a song about, I'm not good at Plattdeutsch. My grandmother spoke Plattdeutsch. That's low German spoken in the north, northern part of Germany. Schleswig-Holstein is where my grandmother was from. It goes, mein Gott, er kann kein Plattdeutsch mehr. Mein Gott, er kann kein Plattdeutsch mehr. My God, he doesn't speak Plattdeutsch anymore. Plattdeutsch is the dialect of northern Germany that my grandmother spoke and that this guy spoke. The whole record that I have, I'm talking about, is in Plattdeutsch, in Low German. And there's somebody who went to work in a big city, came back, and this is what the relatives are saying. My God, he can't speak Plattdeutsch anymore. It's sort of like, it's like a Okay? Yeah, but that's a very good point. They definitely should emphasize politics, too. Anybody else? Okay, good question. Mm. Think a minute of the geography of China. A really large portion of China speaks some dialect of Mandarin. So I can't remember the number. It's something like two thirds of China speaks some dialect of Mandarin, which means that a large part of the country can already communicate with each other, even if the dialect's a little bit different. But where are the places with the biggest differences between dialects in China? Fujian, Guangdong, these areas. They have lots of mountains. When there are lots of natural geographic barriers, this village kind of minds their own business and doesn't have much to do with that village because it's too hard to get over the mountain and go visit them. So if they just keep that state of affairs, they maintain it for a long time, they don't talk to each other for 100 years, what's going to happen? These two villages, they originally spoke the same language maybe way back, but then they migrated, some people migrated here, some people migrated here, and then a hundred years have gone by, and they don't have much to do with each other because the mountains are in the way. It's very hard to get from A to B, so they just don't travel much. It's too hard. It's not worth it. They have their needs taken care of in their own village. So what's going to happen to those two varieties of the language that was originally the same language? Sooner or later, it's going to get harder and harder for the people of these two places to understand each other because they have independent developments. They're not influencing each other much anymore. And they have their own liu, they have their own slang, they have their own cultural habits and customs. And they start developing in different directions and eventually they won't understand each other anymore. That's how it happens. And an interesting thing in a place like going from Portugal through Spain, through France, to Italy. Those are very different languages, at least in many people's estimation, from Portuguese to Spanish to French to Italian. They're all different languages. However, if you go, say, along the coast, from village to village, what do you expect to find? Starting from Portugal and moving all the way to Italy. What, what would you expect to find? Here's Portugal, and so suddenly Portuguese turns into Spanish. And here's France, so suddenly Spanish turns into French. And here's Italy, and suddenly French turns into Italian. Is that what you expect? No, what are you going to expect? There will be a mix in between, like at the borders. And, and part, French part, Portuguese, You can put it in those terms, but you will find incremental changes from one place to the next. So from this village to villa this village, there's not much difference. To the next village, there's a little bit of difference. And then the next village, has a little bit of difference from this village. So this village is now quite different from the original village. But if you go between any two villages, there's not much difference. It's when you go far enough away, this one is now quite different, different from the first one. You will find a continuum of dialects as you go along to a new cultural area and language area. It's not clear borders. Those are political borders. However, there is one other interfering factor. Governments have different attitudes towards dialects. Some Governments don't mind 
Some say, speak whatever you want. We use the standard language in school, but we don't mind other dialects. They're fine with us. Some governments are very heavy-handed. They want everybody to learn the standard language properly and be part of the same cultural group. And there are many reasons for this. One reason for this is what? Why would a government want to do that? Your own government did this. You know, they just, they don't live and let live. They want to make sure everybody speaks the this, this same standard language no matter what. And you have our same cultural values and customs, et cetera. Why would a government want to do that? That's, you can stop right there, control. Control. That's the word. For better control. Because how do you feel when there are two people standing not far from you speaking in a language you don't understand? How do you feel? That's right. They feel like either they're outsiders or you feel like an outsider, one or the other, or both. And do you sometimes wonder if they're talking about you or? <laughs> the thing is, you don't know what they're saying. And that makes you feel pu'an. And that's even more true of government. For us, it doesn't matter, because maybe you've learned not to care what other people think. But governments really care what people think, especially if they're going to plot against the government. And if you can't understand them easily, then they might be doing things right in front of your face and you don't know. But if every, everybody has to speak the same language, then we hear everything clearly. We can keep close tabs on everybody. OK? So governments may be heavy-handed, or they may say, dialects are fine. Germany is not really um, that set on forcing everybody to speak standard German. Of course, it's used in politics, in schools, and so forth. Everybody has to learn the standard language. But they don't try to suppress dialects so much in Germany, not so much. Some of it happens naturally. The people just start speaking the standard language. But France is a different case. France is, I would say, a culturally chauvinistic country. And I'm not saying that with any ill will. It just is true. And when they, start, they set up colonies, for example, in where, where are there a lot of French colonies, or where have there been? Africa, right? So a lot of the people in Africa, they were not treated as foreigners or colonists. They were expected to be full-fledged French people, Frenchmen. So they had to learn correct standard French, like everybody else. So wherever France went, everybody had to learn the same French. And within France, a lot of dialects have been suppressed. Many of the dialects are now dead in France because of that. There's one group that I know has been working at revitalization of their dialect. It's called Occitan. And if you're curious about this, just Google it. You'll learn something about Occitan, Languedoc, et cetera. And not that many people speak it natively, but they're trying to revive it. Um, Breton has not done very well. The language that's spoken in Bretagne, it's not even a Romance language. The language of Bretagne, called Breton, is related to what? Anybody know? It's who said it? Celtic. It's Celtic, that's right. I say Celtic. Some people say Celtic. It's a Celtic language, most closely to re related to what living language? Do you know? Exactly. It's most closely related to Welsh, which is not so closely related to Irish and Scots Gaelic. So Irish and Scots Gaelic, Scottish Gaelic, that's one group. And then this is another group. So uh, Breton and Welsh are quite closely related. Breton is not doing well. Breton is an endangered language because they were all also, uh, they used very strong-headed measures to get the Bre people of Bretagne to speak French. So Breton is not widely spoken. It is also being revived now. But there are four dialect groups. And that's the problem when you're trying to revive a language. You don't have many people to start out with. They'll say, Use my dialect as the standard. My dialect's better. No, I grew up with this dialect. My dialect should be the standard. So you have few people with very little power to start out with, and then they're broken up into four groups. That makes it worse. That's happened, I think, to some extent with Basque, and also definitely with Breton. I read a piece about it. So language revitalization is really difficult. Um, how about for Yuan Zhumi, languages in Taiwan? What's happening? Do you know? Sorry? 
Yes, but not at equal rates. And some, are, some languages are doing much better than others. Which native language of Taiwan has the most speakers? Amis, that's right, Amis on the eastern coast of Taiwan. They're doing the best. A lot of people do speak, still speak Amis. That one is not quite so endangered. However, a lot of the kids are not learning it. But because the government has also now made, made efforts to revitalize the language, some children are now learning it. And what often happens, and this has happened with American Indian languages in the US, Native American languages, the people in the middle, the people between 35 and say 60, 35 to 60, they don't speak the language. They may understand a little, but they don't speak it well. But grandpa and grandma who are 70 or over, they still speak it well. And now in some revitalization efforts, they're opening up kindergartens in Native American languages. And they're doing something similar with Aboriginal languages in Taiwan. So the children get it. If you're under age eight or over age 70, you're learning the language. It's the people in the middle who have lost it. So they're trying to get grandparents to connect with grandchildren, to try and work up a momentum and save the language. It's the people in the middle that are kind of mediocre. I've asked a lot of Aborigines in Taiwan. In fact, um, just this break, I went to Eastern Taiwan and I asked a number of Aborigines. They were all over the place. If you go to Hualien, and I asked quite a few people. All of them spoke beautiful Mandarin, and I asked them about their children. And they said, for example, two people told me that. So their children are learning it in school, just like you learn Minanyu at school, but it's not good enough to really speak well. They're learning it, and they can pass the test, but they don't speak really well. Others are luckier their parents or grandparents kept the language and, and insist on it. I once ran into an, a tile woman. She was about 65 years old. And she was really interesting. I met her around Guting, um, Nafujin, waiting for a bus. And she said she only speaks a tile to her kids and grandkids, and they all speak well. And she says the important thing is we don't have a TV in our house. She says we don't have a TV. And all of her kids and grandchildren speak good a tile. They live in Wulai. That's unusual, but it happens. So anyway, about languages disappearing, becoming endangered. They can also come back. And you know the story of Hebrew. Hebrew was originally a biblical language. The Old Testament was written in Hebrew. It was still used for religious purposes in synagogues and in studies of the Talmud. But when, when Israel was founded, they decided that they should have Hebrew as their native language. There is a story, which turns out to be not quite so true, that there was one father who taught his son to speak Hebrew natively, and then everybody learned it. It's not that simple. That's the story they tell you. But it simply happened, I would say, as an act of pure will. They decided Hebrew is going to be our language. And they really worked hard at getting everybody to speak Hebrew to their children. And now Hebrew is the native language of Israel. It's not exactly the same Hebrew of the Bible. It's modern Hebrew. But it's much simpler, as I understand. But they succeeded. It can happen. It's happened with some Native American languages. It depends on your will. If you really, really fight, you can do it. OK, anything else? Says, says, uh huh. It says, uh -huh. it says that the most likely possibility is that speech go around in one place, but is it possible that um, many groups of people start starting to speak uh, their own languages at this, about the same time and they and then they evolve to different languages? Because uh, why is um, be so determined that? the most likely possibility is that the speech starts from one place. Oh, okay. Are you talking about all human languages now? Yeah, I, I think so, because I I sort of, uh, I remember that we learned about Proto-Indo-European languages. In uh, Yugai. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, but oh, in Yingwe, maybe, or no, Yugai. It's, yeah, it's Yugai. Yeah. But it, it seems that some languages like Basque is not related to any of the languages, you know. So is it possible that different groups of people start speaking rather than a group of people? 
We have no answer to that okay. so far. But we have what we call the lumpers and the splitters. And look for a book by Rulin. And he will discuss that in detail. So if you're interested in that, look for the book by Rulin and also look into Joseph Greenberg. You'll find a lot of material on it. Um, I personally don't know for sure because there are many explanations no matter how you interpret the data we have. The lumpers want to put as many languages together as possible and say that they all have the same origin. Those are the lumpers. That's lump. But the splitters say, no, these languages are really quite different from those languages. They must have had a separate origin. And so, honestly, we don't know. Because from what we can see, we can only posit relationships to a certain degree. For example, Indo-European, we are quite sure that that was definitely originally the same language. We're quite sure. Sino-Tibetan, some people disagree. But many people believe that Tibetan, Burmese, Chinese, other minority languages, they were all originally the same language. But we can't take it any further back than that, because when we get to that proto-language that we reconstruct, and we compare it to the proto-language of, say, proto-Indo-European or whatever, we get stuck, which is why, at present, we believe that there are major language families. There are some isolates that we can't connect to anything else, although recently some isolates have been studied closely and found to actually belong to existing families that we're already familiar with, some. I think Buru Shashki is one of them. I think I'm spelling it right. And Nahali was another one. They found where that belongs. So these languages we thought were isolates. That means this language must have just evolved by itself. It doesn't seem to be connected to anything. We found connections with languages we've already studied. That's happening now. But as for saying for sure that they all have the same origin, I don't think we're able to do that yet. Okay. But if you're into that, you can study it. For, for me personally, when it gets to reconstruction, and I had to do a lot of this in my studies at Shida. I was at Guowen Yanjiu Suo. And a lot of the stuff they do is ni ce gu yin for Chinese. Ni ce zhong wen, the hai yu de gu yin. I never got into that because I thought, there's so many dialects now. There's so much about Chinese as it's spoken now that we don't know. Why should we guess about things that may or may not have happened? We can't be sure. It's all guess. Of course, we're basing it on data. We're, we're collecting good data. But in the end, it's still guessing. This is what we think it is, but we have no proof. And one guy who really got that ball ro rolling was Carlgren. Gauben, hi. Bernard Carlgren. He was a Swede from Sweden. And he sort of started up the study of historical Chinese phonology, comparing a lot of dialects and looking at a lot of documents over history, looking at rhymes, for example. He used many tools to try to reconstruct different stages of early Chinese. And after he started, many people followed. So the field of Chinese historical phonology is very developed. It doesn't mean we have definitive answers, but it's very, very developed. Many people spend their time on this. I never could do that because I'm too busy just trying to figure out Taiwan Mandarin. I don't have time for things that may be true or may not be true. Me personally, that's the one chance we'll go to it. But a lot of people do this stuff. OK, anything else? How do they happen? Yeah. Look at the way, listen, I should say, listen to the way you speak compared to your mother. Do you speak exactly like your mother? Think of something your mother or father says that you don't say. For example, remember when I said Kai Yang Hun? My family, my whole family says Kai Yang Hun. None of you say Kai Yang Hun. All right. Woman Cha Ji Dai, Ta Liang Dai Ba, Ta Liang San Dai, maybe Liao Bu Qi. Yi Jin Yo Bian Hua Le. All right. You already don't know Kai Yang Hun. Maybe you know it now. That will change it. But originally, nobody said Kai Yang Hun, and I was shocked. Remember? I just couldn't believe it. How can you not know Kai Yang Hun? Everybody says it, I thought. Everybody in my age group says it. 
okay? Not everybody, but maybe a lot of people, especially Weishman people. You can see just between my generation, your mother's generation, pretty much, and your generation, So what's going to happen with your children? Your children, when they're talking to Nai Nai, to Apo or to Ama, whatever you call her, they're going to have quite different language. So you can see just in your own generation, you can already see the change. And that's within your own family, in your own area. They will have their own things. Some things are popular in the Nambu that are not said in the, in, the, in the north, probably. Yeah. So it happens bit by bit. And there's another reason that I wrote about in one of my papers. And sometimes you say things just for fun. Sometimes they catch on, and sometimes they, they're used for a while, they're fashionable, and then they're toy liu xing. For example, when my daughter was in high school, they liked to say liao bu liao, which meant liao bu liao jie. And when you were in high school, maybe you said it too. Okay, so And it was really popular. Everybody was saying it. She'd be telling me about everything that happened to her in school. No? <laughs> you talk too fast. But does anybody say anymore? Maybe some people do, but it's not so popular. So that one started, didn't catch on. Another one probably started and kept going. Like when I was in Taiwan in the 70s, it's and all of these things, especially for good and bad, those are words that often have slang words for them and that change quite often because we want it to be strong. So those are changing already in my lifetime watching Taiwan. I've seen a lot of words come and go. So you can see it right there. That's a start. Anybody else? And sometimes it's for group identity. For example, maybe gay people have a certain way of talking. To identify, we belong to this group of gay people. Or another group of people, we like to use fancier language, we go to Taida. Or another group of people, they have their own language. You know, I learned Taozui when I was remodeling. Do you know about Taozui? Yeah, okay. So they have their own language. Each group, these are Different occupations, different social groups. So there are many reasons why language will change. Okay, anything else? Hi, Omeo. We need to get to the other text, by the way. So hurry up. Okay, Ma. That's it. Please hand in your summaries. And what chapter will you summarize for next week? Chapter two, and then chapter three after that, and after that we will jump. And did you all put questions in your summaries? Okay, I hope so. And how about your pronunciation improvement? Are you working on it? You should have a gongke for this week. You should have set your goals for this week. Okay, I wanna, I wanna follow up on this. Everybody just tell me one or two pronunciation goals that you are working on this week. bye. Good. 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 Okay, very good. Good. <laughs> I thought you were saying, uh, <laughs> still thinking. <laughs> You're working on schwa. Yeah. And uh, upside down V, wedge, or schwa. 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 Okay, very good. Uh, transferring, between, transferring between rhotic and non rhotic. Rhotic and non rhotic, yeah. Mm -hmm. Accent, yeah. So, after working so hard on British, now you're coming back. Because I, I think I should uh, read in this, uh, standard American in this class, but when I talk uh, daily with, uh, with others, I may use the British accent. That's a great goal. Try to be able to switch. And adding a dialect or adding a new accent or a new way of speaking is not suppressing the old. Please let me make that clear. Because some people think that we're trying to get rid of all variation and change your accent completely forever. All you're doing is adding a new way of speaking. And that would be one of your choices. And then you are more powerful the more, more choices you have. It doesn't mean you should spend your life learning different ways to speak. I was just reading about a guy from Luxembourg. And what do they speak in Luxembourg? They speak French and German and their own language as well. They have their own local language as well. I believe it was Luxembourg. It was under a TED Talk. Some people wrote comments. 
And they said that their education level was not as good as some other countries. Their, their effectiveness in education was not as good. And he said one problem is because you have to learn some classes in German and some in French. So everybody must learn a few other languages in addition to your home language. And they said he believes this is a waste of time. We just want to learn. And one reason he did very badly in math is because it was in German. And as soon as he got a math class in French, he did fine. So there is the other side of the coin. Languages give you power, but on the other hand, it's not everything in life. You should, shouldn't spend all of your time on language because you have to go out and live. So don't get so carried away. Of course, people become linguists, and that's what they like to do with their time, and I'm one of them. But when it comes to making policy decisions for large numbers of people, I think bilingualism is great, but putting too many languages, enforcing or imposing too many languages on a populace is a burden. Yeah, but definitely for yourself, you should learn how to switch. Good. Continuation rise, very good. Compound nouns. Compound nouns, good. Okay. Describing instead of describing. Excellent, good. Okay. So work on those, and you don't have to switch to your new one until you've mastered the old one. Make sure you master it. Don't just mechanically go through something different week by week. Master it completely. And when you're ready, when you feel you've got a handle on it, then move on to the new one. I think that's all of the. Ty Hua, we're done. Check Facebook for links, for new links, because I've posted a number of new uh, links to interesting news stories having to do with either phonetics or language in general. Generally pretty interesting things. At least have a look at them. If you don't read them word by word, at least kind of skim them, become familiar with them. All right, anybody have anything else to bring up before we start? Yeah, let's go. 142. Um, Vivian. Acoustic waveforms and spectrograms of two of the, the words in Table 6.2 are shown in Figure uh, 6.4. Just very quickly, flip back to the previous page and look at Table 6.2. We've already looked at it, and that was the Bunny and Banu page. And we're going to have some other sounds to deal with at the same time. If you look at the third column in Table 6.2, you see dinu, dinu. And that is two things to watch out for. It's got two hooks. The top hook is to show it is an implosive, and the bottom hook shows that it is retroflex. And remember when I told you last semester that we say for Mandarin, but it's not really very dren. The place where they get really dren is in What part? The south part of India. And to remind you, in case you forgot or in case I didn't say it, in the north they speak Indic languages. Sorry. Indic. And Indic is one branch of Indo. Oh, Indo Aryan is the name of the whole family. It's like a Yuzhi, it's like Indo Aryan. It's the area of India where they speak languages related that, are, that belong to Indo European. And then, Bita Hai Gao is Indo Indo Iranian, is one way to refer to it. Just Ila and Indo Yuan, Guanxi Hai Bijao Jin, B, Sama, Xi O, the nation Yuan, Guanxi Jin, Yidian, Indo Iranian. So, Indic languages are the Indo European languages of India, they're spoken. Mainly in the north and in the south, we have a different language family unrelated to the one in the north. Anybody remember what it's called? Starts with a D. It sounds like a familiar English boy's name with, a little ex with an extra letter. Go ahead. Da Wei. How do you say Da Wei? All right, let's add an R. Dravidian. It's easy to remember if you remember that way. So Dravidian, it's not related to the Indo-European languages in the north at all. But they have features in common. So that means this area, in this area we find what? That we talked about earlier. 
This semester? Sprachbund. There's a Sprachbund. They have many features in common, even though they're totally unrelated. And one of them is retroflexion. Okay, so we have retroflexion in both parts of India, but in the south it's really dread. And that's, that may be where it came from. Uh, I'm not sure about that though. Um, so when we see a hook at the top, that means it's implosive, a hook at the bottom, that means it's retroflex. So can you curl your tongue to make a duh, duh. All right, and then we're going to try to make an implosive. Dinu, dinu, dinu. So when you see two hooks, that's what's going on. Let's continue. There are several differences in these display in displays relating. Do it again. In in the these dis these in these in these displays in these. Displays Good. relating to the differences between the vowels and intervocalic consonants that were that we will return to later in this book. But for now, we would like to focus on the initial consonants, the the and the and the the is palmonic and the is implosive. And what is intervocalic? What does that mean? What does intervocalic mean? Very good. Between vowels. How do you say before a vowel? Before a vowel. It's easy. Just put it together. From prevocalic and after a vowel? Postvocalic. Prevocalic, intervocalic, postvocalic. We're going to use those. Not to show off, but because they're handy words. I just read somebody's blog saying that. People seem to have a very esoteric vocabulary just to show off. Esoteric means very xuan, That means not many people know it and it's very difficult. And you find that in some areas of study. They use a lot of fancy terms, maybe in some branches of philosophy. But it's 觉得那些东西还蛮空洞的. That happens sometimes, but this blog said often we really do need those words. They're really handy. They save a lot of description. Okay, they're shorter. Go ahead. Both of these start with a short. Both of these. You saw it, Julia. Put that in your notes. These usually. Okay, both of these. Both of. These start with a short period of low amplitude voicing. Uh, voicing. Voicing. Right. Uh, which in the spectrogram. Which in. Which in. Good. Which in, in the spectrogram appears as a gray bar. At gray bar? Gray. When you're not done, always use the continuation rise. Gray bar mm -hmm. at the bottom of the spectrogram. Has everybody found the voice bar at the bottom of this page, 142? Does everybody see? All right, I'll show it up in my book, just by the relative position, even though it's far away. See, right down here, they have the numbers. It looks like a ruler. Right above that, you see these gray lines that go all the way through. In both of those sounds. Do you see it? That is called the. We just read it. What did Vivian just read? Vivian, what's it called? Low and. Oh, go ahead, Jerome, you have it. That's the voice bar. Everybody, you need to recognize that we're going to start reading spectrograms quite soon. So we're going to have to learn the parts of them and what they stand for. The voice bar are those evenly spaced vertical lines below 500 hertz because that is the domain, the fan way of what? Of our human what? Fundamental frequency is what I'm after. Normally. I mentioned that last semester. So 
If we are making any kind of voicing, it will be in that, in that area, below 500 hertz. Right now I'm speaking at about maybe 260. 260 hertz, that's about my range. I'm, I have a fairly high voice, but not a really high mousy voice. And some people have a really low voice. So we'll go from maybe 120 to say 300 hertz. But 500以内就是比较保守. That's where we will have voicing. The fundamental frequency of the human voice is in that area. Okay, why don't we just finish the paragraph? Uh, this is called the voice bar and in, is an acoustic property of all phonetically voiced stops. All right, so I guess I was jumping ahead on that. You hadn't read it yet, but the voice, we did talk about it last semester though. It is an acoustic property of all phonetically voiced stops. Let's just make sure we understand everything in the paragraph so far. So we have two, two words. One of them is an implosive and one of them is pulmonic. They're both retroflex, but the one on the left is implosive and the one on the right is a normal pulmonic plosive. Normal pulmonic plosive. And by the way, implosive in Chinese should be ne bao yin. Ne bao. Ejective is why bao. Implosive ne bao yin. I didn't give that to you last time. I think that's the best translation. Okay? Um, there are several differences that you will notice between the vowels and the consonants that are between vowels. And we'll come back to those later, not now. But for now, we're just going to focus on the initial consonants, which are r and r. D and D. Both of these start with a short period of low amplitude voicing. In other words, their VOT is plus, zero, or minus. Think back now on your tutorials. Their VOT is plus, zero, or minus. Before we've even exploded the stop, we've already got voicing. You can see it in the voice bar. In that area below 500 hertz, you can see those vertical uh, regularly paced, uh, spaced vertical stripes. So we have negative, zero, or positive VOT. Negative. The voicing starts before the stop is released. Okay? So your voicing. So or that's pre-voicing. You can also call that pre-voicing. It's negative onset of voicing related to the release of the stop. So low amplitude voicing. Why are they low amplitude? Well, it's our fundamental frequency. And what happens, amplitude here, we're talking about loudness. Why is it not so loud? Why is it low amplitude? 政府比较低就是它的声音并不大. Because both for and for both of them have low amplitude voicing before we release the stop. Because we some being both Oh, what about the air pressure? There's a very simple reason. Is this? Is this louder or is this louder? I'll compare two things. Ba. Ah is is okay too, huh? Got my mouth open, right? For ah, I open my mouth, and for my mouth is closed. What happens when your mouth is closed? Okay, it's low amplitude because in this case it's our tongue curled back to make a retroflex D. And it's keeping the air out. That means So it's low amplitude. And that's the gray bar at the bottom of the spectrogram. Also called the voice bar. It's an acoustic property of all phonetically voiced stops. Why did he put phonetically there in parentheses? What's the difference between a voice stop and a phonetically voiced stop? Remember I keep emphasizing in this class, we're talking about the way we actually pronounce things rather than just structures and systems and theories. What's the difference between what we might call a voice stop and a phonetically voiced stop? For some language, 
Excellent. Good. Jaffin. Jaffin, that's the right answer. Because boy oh boy, no voicing. Is b called a voice stop in English? We call it a voice stop, but it's very often not voiced. When we say phonetically voiced, that means stops that are really voiced. We call them voiced and they really are voiced. Okay, ming fu qi shi is what it means here. Phonetically here means ming fu qi shi de. All right, so for um, all phonetically voiced stops, we will see that voice bar that shows that there really is voicing going on, that holong holong, the u, the in. And so both r and r are, are voiced. Let's stop there. We need a break. We'll finish it after break. The language that we have data from is called what? The, the data that we're looking at now is from what language? Sindhi, right. It's an Indo-European language of India. And did I mention that we had a student who spoke Sindhi one year? We actually had a, a Sindhi speaking student in the class one year and she got very excited because she could give us all the data herself. Uh, her name was Barbie and she's now married and has a bunch of kids and she's back in India. And she spoke beautiful Chinese. She still speaks beautiful Chinese. So it was fun. Sometimes we get foreign students and they contribute a lot to the class. All right. Both r and r are voiced. So for both of them, we have a voice bar. So r, the implosive is on the left and the pulmonic one is on the right. Do you see the voice bar in both? Is there anybody who doesn't? Raise your hand. If you don't, I will come and show it to you. It's just that line of vertical gray or sometimes black mark markings at the bottom. That's the voice bar. Both of them have a voice bar. But we're going to learn about some differences. And this is a new part, actually, of the book. This is new in this edition, some of this information. Um, they both start with low amplitude voicing. That means for both the implosive and the pulmonic D, you'll see that there is some pre-voicing and the amplitude is low. But one looks longer than the other, actually. Let's see what it says. Continue. Sylvie. So both d and d are voiced. Are voiced. Interestingly, the pulmonic voice stop d has a longer voice bar than the glottalic in ingressive stop. Mm -hmm. Glottalic. Glottalic. Right. Okay. Ingressive stop. All right. So look. <clears throat> Please look at the one on the right. I just mentioned that the length seems different of that pre-voicing, right? Of the negative onset of the voicing. It's longer for the pulmonic one than for the implosive one. So for uh, duh, it's longer than for duh. And if you think about it, you can probably think of a reason why it's so. But we notice that the voicing is longer for the pulmonic stop. OK, go ahead. This characteristic is Char Not correct. Characteristic. This char characteristic. Right is present for the other Lakota pairs in table 6.2. Two. 6.2. Two. 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 6.2. Yep. But has not been reported as a phonetic char characteristic of the pulmonic implosive contrast in other languages. In other. Can you link? In other languages. Very good. So this suggests that maybe it's a universal. Maybe it's inherent in the contrast between pulmonic and implosive stops, that which one has longer pre-voicing, pulmonic or implosive? Pulmonic or implosive has longer pre-voicing. Pulmonic. It could be a universal. Maybe that happens in all languages that contrast pulmonic with implosive initial stops. It might be. We don't know. We haven't compared a lot of languages. He's saying it's not mentioned in the literature. We find it in Sindhi and we also find it in what? In Lakota, which we've already listened to in another class, in a previous class. But it hasn't been reported that this is tian sheng yi ding hui jiang zi, hai mei you xie. And you will find that we often assume that all the basic important things we need to know will be in the textbook. We often assume that, don't we? We like to believe that because we have come here, we've paid good money and are dedicating 
very, very precious years of our young life to going to a university, and we expect at least that they should tell us the truth and everything we need. That's what we expect. But do we have any right to expect that? No, we don't, actually, because we are all human. And textbooks are written by humans. And very often, things get completely reversed years later. They find what we were teaching previously was totally wrong, exactly backwards. It often happens. So take everything you learn, everything you hear from every teacher, everything in every textbook, you have to take it with a grain of salt. This is what people have ob observed. These are the conclusions they've drawn. This is the theories that they have formed. But they may be wrong. And they may be, may be missing something really basic and important. And I'm finding that the things that I, for example, correct you on in English, I think they're really basic and important, but many books say nothing at all about them, most books. Some books say nothing. I would say that, well, I can't say all books, I haven't read all books, but it's really common that books don't mention a lot of these things at all. So there are a lot of things that will not be mentioned in the books. They may be wrong. Things that, there are things that they simply didn't notice, and that's what they're saying here. Let's go on. There is one, uh, one other difference between the and the that is consistently present for contrast between implosives and plosives. You will notice that in the implosive du, the voice bar grows louder over time, while in the pulmonic stop du, the amplitude of the voice bar decreases over time. Decreases over time. You had it just about right. Decreases over time. Decreases over time. Good. This difference is almost always seen when we compare regular pulmonic stops and implosives and might be a good cue to look for as you practice making the distinction. Very good. So this is actually a hint to you in learning how to produce implosives. It also is a little trick for when you are looking at a spectrogram in the future, we're going to read spectrograms. How you can distinguish easily between an implosive and a regular pulmonic plosive initial stop. You can see that although the voice bar is very short, the pre-voicing for the implosive, it's very short, but what happens to the pre-voicing bar before the pulmonic d or d? It's longer, but it gets weaker, right? It's longer, but it gets weaker the further along it goes. But for the implosive stop, it starts to get darker. That means it's getting louder. So I want you to just listen when I produce them, because I was thinking about this before class. You can hear a difference in pitch, and I think that may have something to do with the larger amount of energy we're hearing. Um, the first one is implosive. And the second one is we're like working up to when we're going to explode. And then for the plosive, uh, the regular pulmonic plosive, I'm reaching the jixian. The time is longer, so I have more chance to reach my jixian. So, I've run out of I've run out of breath that I can use to voice with. 我可以我可以發出發聲的那個空氣,這裡有一小柱的那空氣,用完了就沒了。So I can't I can't do it anymore. 因為我只有那那個 pocket of air, that's all I can use to create pre-voicing or produce pre-voicing. Do you understand what I'm saying? Jerome, can you explain it to the rest in Chinese? I'm afraid I didn't express it clearly. Uh it's true for both of them, but because the implosive is shorter, we jump right into the stop. We don't get quite to the jin tou of our ability to create, to produce vibrations. So, I just made it very short. But for the 
harmonic one， 因为那个 voicing 很长，他给我机会把我那个空气用完，用完我就发不出什么声音，声音会变得很弱。So for the implosive, it's short, but it gets stronger. It's working up to that explosion or implosion in this case. But for the for the pulmonic stop, 时间很长 we run out of the air we can use to make the vocal folds vibrate. 可以吗 Is that is that understood? Then let's let's leave it. Okay, that's not that important. I just wanted to make sure you understood it. Let's finish. Oh, I'm sorry. Let's finish. I guess I should finish the paragraph. This difference is almost always seen when we compare regular pulmonic stops and implosives. Might be a good cue. Yeah, I guess we did finish. Let's go on. Tina, we do not know any. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Who's working on stop at stops these this week? We do not know yeah. any foolproof way of of teaching people to make implosives. Some people can learn to make them just by make them make them just by imitating their instructor. Others can't. Peter Ladefoga inc incidentally was one of the later group. One of the later. Right. Okay. He did not learn. Did. Not did, did. it's did. Uh -huh. He did not learn to make implosives until nearly the end of the of a year studying phonetics. Not ear, year, 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 year. That's better. Everyone, year. year. All right. And why is he willing to say this? Well, why was he? He's no longer with us. Why was he willing to admit it took him a year to learn how to make an implosive? He wants to encourage you. That's right. But people who are saying, "I used to be a 90-pound weakling, and look how strong I am now," or people used to say, "I used to be really ugly, but now I'm a beautiful actress or model." If people say, "Well, I used to be an ugly duckling when I was young," what kind of people will say that? People who are still ugly now? No. People who are still ugly now, they go, "I'm sure you were ugly when you're young, because you're still ugly now." <laughs> What's the point? Hmm? Right. When you become powerful and famous, then you are able to share your weaknesses of a previous time. But if you're still weak, people don't want to hear about your weaknesses. They can see you're still weak. And that's true. I mean, that's cruel, but it's true. So he's saying he can say with full confidence because he was such an expert. He did so much research. He was able to. Reproduce almost any sound like a native speaker. Basically, he can say, "You don't have to feel bad because it took me a year to learn them." He can say that because he was strong when he said that. <laughs> All right,、um, and then about Keith Johnson, who is our second author.、Um, Keith Johnson learned to make implosives by imitating his instructor's funny pronunciation of Alabama and Alabama, Alabama. Right. And then realized that he also also used the impl the impulsive in imitating the noise of liquid pouring from a bottle.、Uh -huh. Pouring, pouring. All right, and you know for sure that this is new because the previous editions were only written by Peter Ladefoged. And this is our new author making a comment. So this was new to me, and I found it very interesting. It was very fun to read.、Uh, Peter Ladefoged had this line in from the very beginning, probably. And Keith Johnson is saying how he learned to make implosives. His instructor said Alabama apparently with an implosive. So instead of saying Alabama, he probably said Alabama, 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 Alabama. Apparently, maybe he was a southerner. He probably did it on purpose, but I suppose it's possible that they do it anyway, not on purpose. I, I assume it's on purpose. So Alabama, bleh, bleh, bleh. that's an implosive. So that's how he first learned how to make an implosive. And after he learned it through that funny pronunciation of Alabama, Alabama, then he realized he already knew how to make implosives when he was imitating the sound of. 
Right. So you can use that too. I think that's an excellent thing to add to this chapter. I haven't seen that before. I discovered it myself as well. I may have mentioned it in class. Okay. If you're imitating the sound of gulping down water or of water being poured into a bottle. So everybody, try. And actually, we had a song when we were kids going to summer camp that used that, that sound. It was part of the song. So we were taught implosives when we were about 13 years old or 12 years old. And I'll do just a part of the song so you'll know that it, it is a real song and it really had implosives. Okay, it's a silly children's song. It goes, <laughs> went the little green frog one day, <laughs> went the little green frog, <laughs> went the little green frog one day, and his eyes went, <laughs> <laughs> So, mm, 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 mm. those are implosives. So we learned it in a song. Often silly noises that children make are, are sounds that we're going to learn in this chapter. Remember like the, oh, uh, that was another silly children's sound. And other sounds that we make like, children like to make sounds like that. Those are clicks. So sounds that we make just for fun when we're kids, it shows that they are a universal ability of all humans to make these sounds. Some of them are used in language, many of them are not. And Peter Latifoged will make the argument very soon, later in this chapter, that clicks actually are really good language sounds because they're very clear and distinct, like you can hear it throughout the room. He's wondering why more languages don't use this as a normal sound. They spread over South Africa, but not beyond that. Those are the only ones we know of who use clicks in languages. He says, but they're perfectly good phonetic sounds. Why don't we use them? He has no answer. Okay. Mm. So, everybody try it? I have a nasal at the end. Everybody try it. Right. So, he found that he already knew how to make nasals. I'm sorry, knew how to make implosives when he was using this um, onomatopoeia. Let's go on. The best suggestion we can make is to start from a fully voiced pl plosive, say, a ba, making sure that the voicing continues throughout the closure. Now say this sequence slowly, making the closure last as, as, as long as you can, while man as you man can as you can while maintaining strong vocal folds vibrations. Your maintaining is better. You can make it even better, but it's pretty good. It's much better now. Maintaining. Main. Maintaining. Good. Okay. Release the closure. Open Release the lips. Release the closure. Release the closure. Open the lips. Before. The lips. Open the lips. Always use the con continuation rise before you're done. Go ahead. Before. The voicing stops. Mm -hmm. If you put your fingers on your throat above the la larynx while doing this, while doing this, while doing this, okay. you will probably be able to feel the larynx feel feel, mm -hmm. feel the larynx moving down moving down during the closure. Very good. All right, you read very well. Um, the he says the best suggestion that, that he can offer is to start from a fully voiced plosive like ba, ba, and then say, oh well, it says a ba, a ba, lengthen that b, and make sure that the voicing continues throughout the closure, a ba, a ba, and then he says, say it slowly and um, release the closure, that means open the lips before the voicing stops. So before, before you turn off the voicing, open your mouth. So, um, uh, um. you might be able to produce, produce an implosive. I tried this before class, it didn't work so well for me. The other methods work better for me. And let's go to the web page. And I'm going to assign this, please put this in your assignments your list of assignments, and I will update the web page later. We need to read page three of phonetics two, and also page four. 
Page four, we've only covered ejectives and implosives. We haven't done clicks yet. So you only need to read as far as we've gotten in the textbook. But this will clarify what I started telling you in class last time and wasn't so sure about. It was Smalley who gave the hint about the little bit of grass on the tip of your tongue to produce an ejective. Everybody remember? And we're trying to get rid of it. And that's a lingual labial ejective. And it was Katrina Hayward who I also referred to. She says, try breathing out all your air and then say a k. And then try to make a k. In that way, you can probably produce an adjective. Okay. So this will have a collection of these little hints plus links to samples. Some of them are Latifoged's own and some are from other sources. And the next part for implosives, there's only one link, and that's to a page by John Coleman, who is at Oxford. So read ejectives and implosives on page four. Page three plus ejectives and implosives on page four. Uh, anyway, those are different suggestions to try to get you to make implosives. I like the swallowing sound, the water sound. Ooh, ooh. I think that's probably the easiest because most people can make that sound anyway. Let's go on. Miranda, there are straightforward mechanical reasons why the larynx moves down in these circumstances. 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 How many stresses do we usually have in a word? How many main stresses are there in one word? One. So if you're saying circumstances, that's too many stresses. And in this case, the main stress is at the beginning. Circumstances. Everyone, circumstances. Circumstances. Right. The other thing is larynx. Larynx is OK on the East Coast. For my sister's in-laws, it's fine. They live in Brooklyn. But I say larynx, lair, 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 like Larry. Everyone, larynx. 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 Good. Continue. To maintain voicing throughout a b, air must continue to flow through the glottis, but it cannot continue to flow for very long, because very long, very long because while the articulatory position of b position position mm -hmm. of b is being held, the pressure of the Not air pressure 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 of the air in the mouth is continually increasing as more air flows through the glottis. To keep the vocal folds vibrating, the air in the lungs must vibrating. be... Vibrating. Everybody remember? Vibration. Vi vibrating. vibrating. In British, they sometimes say vibrate. It's true. I say vibrating. Vibrating. The air in the lungs must be at an appreciably... Hmm? Try again. Appreciably right. higher pressure than the air in the vocal tract so that there is a pressure dropped across the glottis. Let's just stop there to make sure that we understand everything. Why does the larynx go down? In order to keep on voicing during the B, we still have to have air coming out of the lungs and going through the glottis. Is that right? So we've got a tiny, tiny stream of air that comes out and pops above the vocal folds. We have to keep that up. But it can't do that too long because when we are making a b, we have only the space in our mouth behind the lips where we can store that air that's coming up from the lungs. That part is clear, right? So we run out of space. So we can only make it so, uh, maintain it so long, and then we have to stop. It's not going to last forever. And we don't usually puff out our cheeks. If we puff out our cheeks, actually, there would be time for more. So I'm done. Okay. One of the ways of maintaining the pressure drop across the glottis is to lower the larynx and thus increase the space available in the vocal tract. Okay. Consequently, there oh, wait. is. Wait, so let's explain that. 
So we're going, we have no more space. To make more space, since our lips can't move out anymore, we have to push something down. So we push the larynx down. That part is clear too, right? Consequently, there is a natural tendency when saying a long b to lower the larynx. Good. Say long again. Long. Good. If you try to make a long, fully voiced b very forcibly but open the lips before the voicing stops, you may end up producing an implosive b. b. Right. And this is what they described in the previous paragraph where he says the best way that I can uh, suggest to you to make an implosive is to do this. This is, this is just repeating what he suggest, uh, suggested. Go ahead. You can check your progress in learning to produce implosives by using a straw in a drink. Using a what? Straw. How do you say it? Straw. 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 Mm -hmm. In a drink. Hold a straw immersed, straw. Straw, mm -hmm. immersed in a liquid between your lips while you say a ba. A ba. You should see the liquid move upward in the straw during the ba. Um, I didn't bring a straw to demonstrate in class because it's kind of messy. Yeah, you probably end up dribbling. So if you really want to do this, say a ba. And then I don't know. I think it's also a bit dangerous because you might get water in your lungs. So I don't really suggest this. All he's doing is he wants you to know for sure that air is coming in to make it an implosive. Yeah, honestly, I don't really suggest this. Uh, Jerome, historically, languages seem to develop implosive from plosives that have become more and more voiced. In many languages, in as many languages, in many in many languages, why do we do that? Uh, continuation rise. It's a continuation rise, but we didn't stress languages because it's mentioned before. That's true. And what are we doing with many? <laughs> it's like saying in some languages, it's implying a contrast with other languages that don't have it. So in many languages. There are also languages that don't have it. So in many languages. In many languages, as we mentioned earlier, voiced implosives are simply allophones of voiced plosives. Voiced plosives. Voiced plosives. Uh -huh. Often. Well, voiced plosives. You can also stress plosives because that contrasts with implosives. So voiced implosives are simply allophones of voiced plosives. That way all the contrasted elements are pretty clear. Can you try that again? Voiced implosives are simply allophones of voiced plosives. Perfect. Good. Often, as in Vietnamese, 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 Good. these language these languages have voiced. These languages was fine. The first time was fine. These languages have voiced plosives that have to be fully voiced to keep them dis distinct. Mm -mm. The first one. To keep them distinct from two other sets of plosives. To other sets of plosives. To other sets of plosives mm -hmm. that we will discuss in the next section. Mm -hmm. Plosives with an S. Yeah, go on. In, in languages such as Sindhi, for which we have good evidence of the earlier stages of the language. The earlier stages of the language. The earlier stages of the language. Mm -hmm. We can clearly see that the present implosives grew out of older voiced plosives in this way. Older voiced plosives in this way. Older voiced plosives in this way. Good. The present contrasting voiced plosives are contrasting voiced plosives. The present contrasting voiced plosives are due to later. The voice higher jong again because we're contrasting. So once more, the present contrasting voiced plosives. The present contrasting voiced plosives mm -hmm. are due to later influences of neighboring languages. Remember what kind of effect? The Sprachbund effect. So they had to definitely keep voice initial stops separate from voiceless initial stops like you have to do in many languages, say like in French or Spanish. Uh, the difference between ba and ba, ba and ba. But they were also influenced by neighbor, neighboring languages 
which probably is why they adopted the implosives. Okay. Amy, one other airstream mechanism is used in a few languages. This is the mechanism that is used in producing clicks, such as the interjection expressing disapproval that novelists write, tut tut or tisk tisk. Right, that's how we say it when we're reading, but that's not what they really mean. So put a little mark there, we finished implosives. Jerome just finished implosives for us. And Amy is starting clicks for us. So that was the end of implosives. That was fast, wasn't it? Something so very new and weird, we're already done. But it doesn't mean you're done working on them. Uh, if you can produce them, great. If you can really do it, try to help your classmates. If you can't, get help from a classmate, practice, listen to the files, think back on what we mentioned in class, look at your notes, and try to produce them yourself. So I would like all of you to master all of these sounds. I'm not going to fail you if you don't. And I never fail anybody. Students don't pass, that's their business. I don't fail anybody. Fail anybody. <laughs> never, yeah, it's always the students who don't, who don't pass. Um, but to get the most out of this class, you should be able to master everything with confidence. And one advantage of it is it's a great party trick. You can make these sounds at parties and people find them very amusing. Have you ever done this when you're with people? Show off the new sounds that you learn in phonetics? Eh, maybe a little bit. Not yet, you will. Because they're gonna get weirder and weirder. <laughs> they're going to get weirder and weirder. So these are fun things to do in class. And I remember I had a friend at the GIO and he was telling me about a friend of his. He said, I have this friend who could speak a click language. He was really popular at parties. So they would invite him to parties just to hear him speak a click language. He was a white guy, I guess. And that was very impressive. The click languages are often very difficult because they have tones and clicks. And they're not that easy to master. You can do it, but it's very complex. And some of them, some are easier than others. And when I was in South Africa, we went on some trips. We were mostly singing, but we also went on some tours. And one of our local guides, she knew that the tourists would be really interested in the clicks. And we were right in these caves with Bushman carvings and drawings. And she did these clicks near the caves, and they really resonated. Like the whole valley was full of these clicks. They're very loud. I can't do them that loud. But listen to native speakers. Listen to the files online. Go anywhere where you can find a file of somebody speaking Zulu or, or Hosa. And you'll find the clicks are very loud. Oh, there's radio. There's a radio station where you can hear them. And Taman Chong Fu, the nega. Yeah. In, in the introductory music to the station, they have a little phrase that they repeat over and over again with a very loud click. So if I think of it, I'll put the link up. And you can just listen to how loud they are. Um, yeah, so these sounds are weird for us, but not so weird. First of all, because we're phonetic students, we're used to this. But second, because like we mentioned earlier, we made a lot of these sounds all by ourselves as children. We did them for fun, so they are not so unfamiliar. And I can remember making implosives, like I said in the song we learned at camp, or in when we were just going Bleh, for fun. You discover them just by playing around, making sounds. So they are not that strange. All right, now we are starting on clicks. And like I said, there's only one part of the world where the languages use the clicks as regular language sounds. What are, where are they? in southern Africa, not just the country of South Africa, but also in Namibia and uh, other, other areas, other countries in that area. And they were originally a feature of the Bushmen languages. And the Bushmen are quite different from the other tribes that later invaded that area. They were the Bantu tribes. In Chinese, it's Bantu. They came from a more northern part of Africa. And they were very aggressive and powerful. And they conquered tribes all over the place. So the Bantus spread further and further south. And they pushed back a lot of the Bushmen to a very small part of southern Africa. And they're very meek, peaceful people. And they live a, a, a very precarious existence. Originally, they did. And in a desert with no visible sources of water, they would get water from things like roots. Did you ever see the movie? The gods must be crazy. Put it on your list. Watch this movie. 
I mean, you have an excuse to watch a movie. You know, if your mom is saying you should be doing your homework, you say, I am. This was assigned in phonetics. Watch the, good, watch the movie, especially number one. I think there was part two. I don't know about part three. There was definitely a part two. You know, no more Sanji, what would you do? But The Gods Must Be Crazy, it's a very fun movie. Face on the entertaining. It's really, really fun. And at first, I doubted that it was real. I thought it was just some white people romanticizing black people or Bushmen and making things up. But it's, it's very accurate. You will hear their languages spoken with these really loud, really loud clicks. And it's a very funny movie. So The Gods Must Be Crazy, Sangdi Ye Feng Kuang. It's available in the Shiting Tu Shu Guan. So you can watch it easily if you have time before Shaban um, Shijian. Um, that's clicks. And they're spoken in the southern part of Africa. Originally, they belonged, they were only found in the Bushmen languages, but the Bantus invaded and took over the land. And what do you think happened to the Bantu languages of the area? They were originally non click languages. Some of them were tone languages. Quite a few of them are tone languages. But they were originally non click languages. But what do you think happened after they? started occupying areas of southern Africa. They started using quick clicks. So the most famous examples, or the more easily found examples, or the more mainstream languages, are languages like Zulu. Zulu is the biggest. And Hosa. And Nama is another one. And I have to tell a little story about Nama. I was visiting my mother while she was still with us. She's passed away now. I was visiting her in a nursing home in Minnesota. And there was one of the nurses who was taking care of her had an interesting accent. So whenever I hear that, since I was a child, I always say, where are you from? I've just done that ever since I was a kid. He had a really pretty skin color. It was a, a light yellowish brown. So I asked him where he, from, where he was from, and he said he was from South Africa. I said, what's your native language? He said, Nama. I said, Nama, I'm getting my tape recorder. Just a minute, wait. <laughs> so I recorded him. I ran into a Nama speaker. I was so excited, because Nama has a huge number of clicks. Tata clicks hen duo, hen fu zha. So I recorded him. And I can play it for you sometime if you want. Jesus a kashi lu yin dai, yu dan shi jian The thing was, when he was speaking, he found that he'd forgotten a lot of his language. What he said was perfect. It was perfectly native-like. But he even started forgetting numbers because he almost never spoke, speaks his language, or spoke at that time, spoke his language. His wife spoke a different language called Heroe, I think. And they spoke mostly Afrikaans together or English, but hardly ever Nama. So he, for a long time, had hardly used any Nama. And he couldn't remember a lot of simple words in Nama. That was an interesting conversation with him. Really nice guy. And he was also happy to share his languages. So if I get a chance, I'll play it for you. Um, so a lot of the Bantu languages, so that was a real Bushman language. He was a real Bushman, speaking you know, a language that originally had cliques. The other languages that, is a, have, that have adopted cliques, usually the clique system you think will be more complex or simpler. Do you think that their click system will be more complex or simpler in the languages that borrowed the clicks? Yes, it is. Usually they have fewer clicks and fewer complex combinations. We're going to learn about that soon. That will make more sense soon. And another interesting thing is that the further south you go, like Zulu and Posa are quite far south in South Africa. As you go further north, there's a language called Tswana and another one. They also have clicks, but very few. So the further south you go, the more clicks you have. The further north you go, you still have clicks, but they're decreasing in number and frequency. And then you finally get to a point where there's no more clicks. So we learn a number of songs in different languages of South Africa, some with lots of clicks, some with not so many clicks. OK? Um, all right, that's our introduction to clicks. The first one that he's mentioning is a familiar sound. Novelists often represent this sound with tut tut or tis tis, but that's not the sound. It is, and you can all make it perfectly because, in fact, it's part of Chinese, right? Tell me how you use this sound in Chinese. <laughs> yeah, zhe <laughs> right? Meaning what? Feel that you're you're impatient with with something or somebody. 
Can you can you give like a little short conversation? Give an example in Mandarin how you would use it. 就是就是可能在在台北啊，就是如果你走太慢的话，后面的人可能。All right, he's gonna be impatient and say, "Can you please hurry up? And pay attention. There's other people waiting here." Uh, he, usually, he won't say anything. He'll just make the noise. Okay. You should know that he's impatient. Do the rest of you agree with that? Is that your experience too? Or when we disapprove of something. Yeah. When you disapprove of something, how will you do it? Give me a little conversation. Usually, like I just say "ze ze." Nowadays, people just say "ze ze" instead of doing the. That's sound. interesting. Or we may say, uh, when we, 就是我们在惊呼的时候，就是就是比方说，我说我昨天呃做了一件很疯狂的事情，然后就跟。Okay. okay. Good. All right. Anybody else? Do you ever use it to show that you really like something? That's a difference between Taiwan Mandarin and Northern Mandarin because when I was first learning Chinese, my 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 Chinese teacher was a Dongbeiren. He's Manchurian. He is very precise the standard of that film piece from Beijing, and he was Manchurian, just a tall, bent, bent, and that Manchurian. And whenever he got excited in class when he's describing like a beautiful woman or tasty food, and he said then, then he made a lot of noises when he was praising something or talking about something either delicious or very beautiful. Does that sound plausible to you for Bei Fang Hua? Amy's never heard of this. I've heard somebody use that to express that they like something on the television. On television. Somebody speaking. Uh, PRC Chinese or a Taiwanese? Taiwanese? A Taiwanese, but they, they use that, they had that use of it. Okay, and this surprised me because I never heard of anybody going when they like something. Because like you, we, when, in English when we say xiu xiu lie, right? We go, shame on you, you should have done that. And usually shake our heads, shame on you. And that's usually to children, okay? Um, so when I, heard, when I saw him getting excited and smiling and talking about beauty and good food and everything, you didn't put that pay, but that was, that's a northern Chinese usage. That's the first one, and this is called a dental click. That's a dental click. So we already know it, no problem. That one's really easy. Um, another type of click is, okay, go ahead. Another type of click is commonly used to show approval or to signal horses to go faster. All right. How do we make that sound? In English, we can say giddy up, or we can make this clicking noise to tell a horse to go faster. No, that's not the one. We use a different click. We don't, it's not a click, actually. Mayo take a click. Children do that, but it's not a click. I would call that tan shu, or something like that. Uh-huh, it's a different sound. For English-speaking horses, for English-speaking <laughs> masters of horses, it's And what kind of click is that? Where's the air coming out? Look at my tongue. What's my tongue doing? Right? Can you make it, put it in phonetic terms? You've got the right idea. Well, it's true. It's, it's alveolar dental. That's true. But the point is, where is the air coming out? For the first click, it was, it's central, right? It's coming out the front over the tip of the tongue. Or actually, it's going in, excuse me. It's going in, not going out. But for, watch. How am I releasing it? There you go. There we go. You got it. It's a lateral click. It's a lateral click. Just like L is a lateral approximant, this is a lateral click. So everybody try the lateral click. You'll need that for horses if you ever go horseback riding in an English-speaking country. It's not. You can't move your tongue. Just keep your tongue stuck on your alveolar ridge. Anna, can you do it? Uh, it um, can you do it, please? 
Okay, can you pass it along to Bella? Everybody who knows how to do it, share it with somebody who doesn't know how to do it. Can you do it, Sylvie? Can you do it, Tina? There's too many noises in the room, I can't tell. <laughs> You're hesitating so much, I'm afraid that it... It's a very noisy one, and you can hear saliva. Miranda? I can. <laughs> Carol? I think you've got it. Amy? <laughs> Are we... Put your tongue actually up to the center of your tongue is over on your alveolar ridge and on your um, so yeah. And then you just keep it there and then you're making the click through the sides. The air is being released or sucked in through the sides. Jerome? You're making a different sound. We can work on it. So Annie has it. Annie is the master of the lateral click. <laughs> if you need help, go to Annie. She's got it. All right, that's the next one. And then it says, continue. Still another click. Is common use is the gentle pursed lips type of kiss that one might drop on one's grandmother's cheek. 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 Not cheek. Cheek. And cheek. also common. Co common. Right. And all right, everybody knows how to kiss, but for this, we're not. 不是原存音,它就是比较扁的. So, so, the kiss that you give your grandmother, you're not going to smooch your grandmother, right? <laughs> you just have a very, very polite kiss. So, okay, 完全不夸张, just a very minimalist kiss. Okay, that's the easiest one because you can see it, it's the lips. Go ahead. Clicks occur in words. In addition to interjections or Interjections are non-linguistic gestures in several African languages. Zulu, for example, has a number of clicks, including one that is very similar to our expression of disapproval. Okay, um, because your English is, almost, is very native-like, I'll, I'll be even pickier with you. Zulu, for example, has a number of clicks because clicks is repeated. Try it again. Zulu, for example, has a number of clicks. Yeah, that's fine. That's all. Um, including one that's similar to our expression of disapproval, which is which one? The first one we mentioned, namely? That's a dental click, that's easy. Next. Ah, wow, time goes by fast, doesn't it? I guess since we're right at the end of a paragraph, we should just stop there. Well, you have some new sounds to work on. You've got some web pages to look at. And you've got a new chapter in vowels and consonants to work on. You have some pronunciation goals to keep working hard at, continuation rises and change and maintain and things like that. Mm. So I guess for Monday, you need to remember to organize your class notes, put in your pronunciation plan, put in notes from the new Shuda article number 77. Okay, notes from the new article. It should be things you know, and Bella found a mistake in it. See if you can find the same mistake. Yo, we got transcription to 错误. See if you can find it. I'm going to tell them today to fix it. And uh, yeah, review the material online. Try to pre-read. Try to read ahead in the textbook so you come to class ready. And that's it. We'll see you on Monday.